Greetings, Timajulam. Welcome back again to another edition of the Walking with God series. We're almost done. We have two more left uh, after this. Two more left and we're done. And then we close the year and uh, start a new series next year. An exciting new series, actually, um, that God has been ministering to me. So I look forward to being able to uh, start a new series. Uh, but today, we are still on the book of John, and today we are on John chapter 17. Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at today. Now, uh, just to provide some context, uh, if, if, like last week, uh, as I said last week, this is a moment that's happening where Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he's speaking to his disciples, and this is all, you know, if you have a red letter Bible, red letters, red letters, uh, up until... Uh, from 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, it's just red letters, right? Um, and what Jesus is doing is that he's speaking to his disciples before he gets into a time of uh, great turmoil where he gets arrested and flogged and crucified, uh, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. And so this is that period right before that. This is that period before that, that happens. Um, and so the thing is, is that now in chapter 17, is that uh, he's speaking to his disciples and then he proceeds to pray for his disciples, okay? Uh, now, the thing that's important uh, for us to realize uh, before we get into, you know, reading this chapter is that Jesus very specifically mentions that the prayer that he is praying isn't just for the disciples that were there with him but for all who come to faith in him. Because in verse 20, he says, I'm not praying, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Now, I need you to understand, and I want you to be able to place yourself in this context and in this mindset before you go and you read this chapter. That I want you to place in your mind that you are there in that room with Jesus. That let's assume that Jesus has come in the flesh, physically to you, right? And he says, after you guys have a chat, he says, I want to pray for you. <laughs> right? Imagine that Jesus comes and says, I want to pray for you, right? I'm pretty sure for, I don't know about you, but for me, if Jesus says he's praying for me, bruh, uh, everything he says finna happen. You, you get what I mean? Like, this is Jesus praying for you, homie. Like, of course, like, yes, pray for me, Jesus. I believe everything that you're going to pray is going to happen. And so, um, I want you to have this mindset as though you were in the room with these disciples and Jesus is praying for you, right? And so, at this point, as is our custom, I want you to be able to then, with this mindset, place yourself in this, in this, uh, in this prayer, that Jesus is praying, because he's saying that he's not just praying for those guys, he's also praying for all who come to faith in him, which includes you. And so I want you to go read John 17. Go read John 17, and then I want you to come back. So first pause this video, go read John 17, and then come back. All right? So pause the video now. Hey. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Now, what I want us to be able to do today is to just simply go through everything that Jesus prayed for you. Because if Jesus prayed for you, it's going to happen. That's the, that's, it's going to happen. And I want, you to, I want us to just go through, and there's seven things that, that I, I captured here. And I'm sure there's other things you probably would have captured as you read it. But there are seven things that stood out to me of things that Jesus has prayed for us. All right? Now, the first thing that we can capture here is the first thing to capture is that you have been chosen. You have been chosen. Verse 6 says, I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. You know, there's, um, I love to watch the NBA. Uh, that's one of my favorite things to watch. 
And the way that you get to play, uh, let me tell you, there are so many, so many people who know how to play basketball very well, very well around the world. But there is only a select few that get the opportunity to play in the NBA. And how that happens is that you go, you do your thing, and then what happens is, is that as you're there doing your thing, you come for what is called the draft day. And at the NBA draft, there's all this speculation on who will be picked first, blah, who will be selected. And all the teams come, and what they do is that they, they pick players, they select players to come and play for them. In this very same way, God has chosen us to know him. God has chosen us to be a partaker of his grace. God has chosen us before the foundations of the earth were laid. It says that he knew us and that he chose us to be partakers of his grace. This is the, uh, this is the, the epitome of a God who sees the beginning from the end. A God who is literally all things, who is not in the confines of time. And this God who is above all things, who is beyond all things, who is all things, literally chose you. Now, you know, for me, this brings me such incredible comfort as someone who lives within time because there are some things that I just look at and I'm just there like, God, how do you put up with a guy like me? What a wretched man that I am. And then I remember, there are many times this brings me so much comfort when I remember that he chose me, meaning that he has seen me and he already had order, has ordered my steps and has seen this is my guy. And so many times I'm just there like, I don't know why you chose me, but I am just going to accept that you chose me. You know, the thing is, is that for many of us, it's like the way we are, like we didn't choose to be born into the families that we're born into. So let's assume that you're born into the president's family. You didn't choose that. You get what I'm saying? Like, you, you're just born into his family. And so the thing is, it's not for you to spend your life being, uh, wondering why you were chosen. It's for you to be able to spend your life recognizing that because I have been chosen, what a privilege it is for me to be able to live life as one who belongs within this family. And so what does this mean? That instead of living in the wonder and the guilt of why have I been chosen, is instead to be able to ask then, okay, what then must I do now that I belong here? That this is where I belong. And this is the thing that's important, is for you to realize that as Jesus is praying for you, he's saying, I chose you. I've chosen you to be born into my family. And it's for you to realize that for whatever reason, you belong to God. You belong to God. And because you belong to him, he will ensure that you're taken care of. He will ensure that, he, that your needs will be taken care of because you belong to God. He will ensure that the work that he has begun in you, he will see to completion. And so if you're maybe somewhere in the middle where the thing that you look at doesn't look that great, I want you to remember that God chose you. Broken you, weird you, struggling you, he chose you. And because he chose you, he is there for you and he is able to help you because you have been chosen. Amen? Amen. And Jesus prays that. And he says that you, as his disciple, that he chose you. And so you need to recognize that you have been chosen and to begin to live as a chosen one. Second thing he says, the second thing that Jesus has prayed for you is that he says that in his prayer, that you be protected, that he prays that you would be protected. It says here, now I'm departing from the world, they are staying in this world, but I am coming to you, Holy Father, you have given me your name, now protect them by the power of your name, so that they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. The thing that I need you to realize is that you are protected, that you are hedged. And the thing is, is that the enemy comes like a roaring lion. He has no authority or power over you. 
And the thing is that the goal of the enemy is to discourage you and to cause you to be afraid so that while you are afraid, you would be ineffective in doing that which God has called you to do. But Jesus says, and he has prayed over you, and he has said, Na he has prayed over you, and he has asked that you be protected by the power of his name. What is his name? His name is Yeshua, the God who saves. And so at any given time, when we resist the devil, he will flee. We are more than conquerors. And I need this to be able to sink into you. That he has given you authority to overcome all things. All things. That nothing has the power to overcome you. Nothing. And you know, for me, this brings me such great comfort. Because one of the things that I've come to realize is that no matter what a situation looks like, no matter what it looks like, it doesn't matter how gray or dire this thing is, there's nothing that can overcome me. The waters may rage, the storms may come, but nothing can drown me because I am hedged. I am protected. I am protected. And so even if the storm comes and all manner of hype and confusion and whatever, it cannot drown me. And I've seen this and I see this time and time again. And so this is the confidence that we as believers move in because we are hedged, because we are protected. We know that nothing will be able to overcome us because we are his disciples. And so we can be tissued, we can be shown fireworks, but it will not overcome us. Amen. The third thing is that you do not belong to the world, to the world. You do not belong to the world. You know, the thing is that what you, we see here from, as Jesus says in verse 14 and 15, he says, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world. Just as I do not belong to the world, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. So meaning that in this world, this is the cosmos. This is the word that's used here. The cosmos is a system of how things are done, how the world operates. It's, a, it's, it's, it's ideology. It's an ideology of the world. It's the ideologies of this world. It's the idols of this world. And the thing is, is that we do not belong to that. We, do not, we are not subject to the ideologies of this world. We are not subject to the authority of this world. We are not subject to... Uh, the, the, the things that this world is subject to. We do not belong to this world. And the thing is, is that because we do not belong to this world, that's the reason why many times living for God is difficult. Not because in and of itself it's difficult, but because this world is ruled by the evil one. It, the ideologies are guided by the evil one. And because of that, you find that there are many things that are in opposition to God's authority, to God's ordained order. And so it comes as no surprise that living right and doing right is difficult because it turns out that our commitment to God invites opposition. It invites opposition because the evil one is opposed to God's purposes. And so you're living in a world that is opposed to God. You're living in a world whose values do not honor God. And in this world that you do not belong to, you are protected. You have been input and you are protected because you do not belong to this world. You cannot find solace in it. This world and its ideologies must not be your guiding light because you do not belong here. The thing that is your guiding light the thing that is your guiding ideology is God's standard. God's word is your standard. God's word is your guiding ideology. Not what the world tells you, but what God tells you is our guiding principle and ideology. Which leads me to the fourth thing that Jesus prays for you. In verse 17 it says, it says, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. So you do not belong to this world. And that these ideologies of this world are not the guiding principles that you need to be able to have for you because you don't belong here. But he says that teach them your word. Teach his disciples your word. 
And here is the thing, that you have the benefit of knowing God's word. Let me explain this to you. You know, this, this prayer is very specific, where Jesus says that he's not praying for the world, but for his disciples. The thing is that as a disciple, you have the unique benefit of being able to understand God's word. You have the unique benefit of being able to understand the secrets of the kingdom. You know, the thing is that to the world, God's word doesn't make any sense. There's so many things that I hear people who don't believe in God saying, this thing doesn't make any sense. And of course, they're there talking, they're like, this doesn't make any sense, right? But the thing is, in Matthew 13, Jesus, while teaching his, uh, his, uh, the teaching the masses, he, he says a parable. And, and, and this was his custom, that he spoke in parables. It says that he only taught in parables. And in this specific instance, he's giving them a parable about a sower who went to plant some seed. And after Jesus gives this parable to them, it says that his disciples came to him privately, his disciples. And they asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? And this is what Jesus says. He says, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But to those for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken from them. And then what Jesus then goes on to do is that he begins to explain to them plainly to his disciples what the parable meant. The thing is, is that as a disciple of Jesus Christ, God is not interested in speaking to you mysteriously. He is not interested in speaking to you in parables that you cannot discern. Jesus has prayed that you are taught his word. What this means is that when you ask for understanding, you will receive it. This is why when you are reading this chapter, chapter 17, I'm sure there's some stuff that stood out very uniquely for you, but I won't even mention it because it has been given to you to understand his word as his disciple. It has been given to you to understand the secrets of the kingdom. My friends, I can't tell you how many times I have read the Bible, so many times, and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And then it's like, either later that day or some, at some point during the week, it's like, oh, understanding comes around what I just read. And I'm like, oh, man, this is what God was talking about. And the thing that I want you to know is this, is that understanding God's word is a gift to his disciples. This is your inheritance that you have been given the ability to understand his word and you will be taught his word. And so the thing is that when we take the time to go and study God's word, we will be granted understanding. Jesus prayed that as his disciple that you should be taught his word and it has been granted to you to be able to discern what God is saying to you through his word. This is why when you ask for understanding, it will be given to you always, always. I don't recall a time where I've ever asked for understanding, for clarity, for wisdom, and God does not grant it. This is the thing that he has given to his disciples, is your ability to understand is a gift to you. It's not something that you need to, it is a gift that has been given to you. And Jesus, Amikuombea, he has prayed for you that you must be taught his word. This is your gift from your savior to you. You have been permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. It has been given to you to understand the secrets. And all you need to do, just like the last sermon, just ask for understanding and it will be given to you. Amen? The fifth thing that we can take out from Jesus' prayer for us is that every single one of us who is his disciple is on a mission from God. Every disciple Jesus says in his prayer, just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. Jesus came to this earth on a mission from his father. He came to reveal God's heart for his people, to give them eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the mission that Jesus Christ had. And when he came on this earth, that was his mission. And in the same way that Jesus was on a mission, we too are on a mission. 
And the thing is, is that it is important for us to understand that you are in this world as one that has been sent on a mission. You are on this earth as a sent one. You are sent into your family. You are sent into your neighborhood. You are sent into that place where you work. You are sent to those friends. You are sent into whatever sphere of influence that you are in. You are not there by coincidence. You have been sent on a mission. And you are there and you exist as, son, as, 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 as one who is sent. You are on a mission. And that mission is to bring glory to God by being his witness. By being his vessel. By allowing him to use you. By allowing him to be uh, your Lord. To be your savior. To be your king. To be your teacher. Your life is a testimony that Jesus is alive and at work. This is what it means to be a witness, that you're a witness that Jesus is alive and that he is still at work. Your life is a testimony of God's glory. You are on a mission. You are as one who has been sent and you have been planted exactly where it is that you are for a reason. Last week we learned that you, know, you can find the courage to live boldly for Christ. You actually can find that courage to be able to go and live a bold life of a witness, being able to share the gospel with others. And the boldness that we are able to exercise in that comes from us being able to ask for that boldness. But the thing is, is that in every space that you are in, you have been sent. And you are able to be effective where you have been sent. And so the thing is that it's important for us to realize that wherever it is that God has planted us, that we are not victims of that space, but instead we are as those who have been sent on a mission. And every single disciple is a sent one. If before the foundations of the earth were laid, he knew you and he knew that he had called you, then that means that where you are right now, where God has planted you and placed you, you are there as one on a mission, as one who has been sent that you may be the testimony of God's glory, greatness, and goodness, that you may be a witness that Jesus is alive and still at work. Amen? And so, you, as his disciple, as one who, has been, who is on a mission, you have been sent. Number six, Jesus prayed that we would experience unity. In verse 21 to 23, it says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us that the world may believe. The world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you have loved me. You know, one of the places that I think I have experienced the most incredible diversity is in the church. I remember growing up, going to church, and just how diverse the people were there. You know, it's not like a clique where you get to hang out with you, the cool homies. It's like you have people from different backgrounds, different uh, social uh, economic backgrounds from all over. And we're all here because we believe in Jesus. That's a commonality that we have together. The level of diversity you experience in the church is remarkable. You know, you go into spaces, you're just like, who are these people? And these people are your brothers and sisters. And the whole thing is, is that the reason why they're your brothers and sisters is the same way that in, in the same way that you did not choose to be born into the family that you have been born into. It's the same thing, is that in this family, you don't choose who your brothers and sisters are. You, know, you didn't choose your brothers and sisters. And so that's the thing about the union of the church is that it is a unified unit of people from different backgrounds whom you didn't choose. But God loves us all as though we are one big family. And this is the unity that he calls us to. And this is part of the reason why. For me personally, I find it very difficult to be able to come into, you know, regardless of whatever church you go to or whatever space you're in, is to realize that this unity is called upon us because we are so different. 
because we come from all types of places and you have not chosen your brother or sister. And so God calls us into unity. Jesus Christ prays for our unity because we are one family. And so there are all these people who come to criticize the church. Oh, people are so weird. Guys are like this. It's like, yeah, man. The same way you have many issues in your family because they're all just so different. But there's a commonality because you come from one source. It's the same thing in the family of God, that we all come from different backgrounds. But Christ is asking us to, to then he's praying that we would all be unified together, that we would be all unified as one family. And that unity is expressed by us understanding that we are a family. We didn't choose these brothers and sisters, but we've been called to live in unity because we come from him. All of us come from him and our destinies are linked because we are all his disciples. And so this unity that we're being called into, go watch the sermon from last week about how we can be unified and love one another. But this unity that we're being called into is a unity for us as his church and as those who have put our faith in him as our brothers and sisters and all these diverse different people that we get to interact with in the church, that we're called to come with an attitude of unity, of acceptance, that you're going to find some weird people, different people, guys who look, come from different backgrounds, but we are being called into unity together and to understand that we are diverse, so we must be unified. Amen? Amen, amen. And finally... Number seven, that what Jesus has prayed for us is to be, is to live in his presence. Is that we would live in his presence. This is what Jesus says in verse 24 to 26. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O oh, righteous Father. The world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. I can imagine that when the disciples heard this, Jesus praying this, they're like, oh, okay, you know, maybe when we die, we can then get to be in his presence. But in reality, in Ephesians 2, 6, it puts it this way. It says, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. The beauty of this and what Jesus is praying for us is that the ability for us to experience and to live in his presence is available to us today. It's available to us now and every single day of our lives. Because we have his glorious spirit, we get to live in his presence. We get to experience him every single day. Every single day. And the thing that is so joyful about this is the fact that this is just God vibes. Where it doesn't matter what is going on around you. It doesn't matter what is happening. Is that in every single situation, in every single season of your life, in every single moment of your life, that you get the privilege of being able to experience His presence. You know, the other day I remember I, I, I woke up you know, feeling a bit off, feeling weird, um, Mentally, I was just a bit, you know, just in a, a bit of a dark place. And, and I remember, um, you know, usually when I get into that space, the thing that I do is, you know, I, I cry out for help. And I ask God, you know, to help me get out of this, you know, funk that I'm in. And I was just like, just get me out of this whatever web and this whatever it is. And, you know, it's just, I remember as always, I'm always just like, man, I wonder if I can be able to just, you know, I'm always like, you know, I just want to navigate out of this, you know, get a good attitude. And every single time that God would just, just the same thing happened that day. Like it wasn't that something happened or some, you know, some big occurrence or whatever. It's just like the encouragement that came, the uplifting that, I, that came, that I remember ending that day, considering how it started and the way it ended and ending that day and just being like, man, 
God really just swooped in and he says like he he just uplifted me he changed my attitude he changed my thinking my environment he brought insight he brought all this revelation and I was just like what a privilege it is for us to be able to experience God every day Every day we can just get to experience vibes, regardless of the season we're in. That even like, like Joseph, who was in the prison, that even in the prison you get to experience God. You get to see God's, God's, God's revelation of him coming to just help you do things. That's the, the, that we literally, that as Christ has resurrected and now that we have his Holy Spirit, that what used to happen then when they used to experience God in in, in you know, periods, we get to experience him every single moment, every single day, because Jesus has prayed that we would be with him, that we would be in his presence always. How beautiful is that? And that is a gift that you have as his disciple, that you get to enjoy the privilege of being and living continually in his presence. Amen. What a glorious thing it is for us to be his disciples. These are the things that Jesus Christ has prayed for you to experience, for you to have, for you to know. These are the things that he has prayed for you. And I pray that even as you uh, go and just think through all these different things, that you begin to internalize that this is what Jesus has prayed for you as his disciple. Amen? Amen. Now, I never want to end a video uh, again, without inviting anyone who is listening, and you're listening and saying, I'm not a disciple, but I want to become a disciple. I want to be able to experience this life of a disciple. It's lit being his disciple, and you want to be able to experience this. And you're saying that I want to know this Jesus. If you are there and you are, if you, are, you are that space where you want to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, I want you to pray this prayer with me. It's a declaration that allows us to be able to declare him as our Lord and to repent of our sins. And so I want you to pray this prayer with me. You say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for forgiving me for my sins. I give you my life that you may be Lord over my life. Transform me, change me, renew me, use me. I belong to you. Thank you for accepting me. Thank you for giving me your Holy Spirit to help me. Amen. Listen, if you pray that prayer, just hit us up down there in the, 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 the caption. Uh, you're going to have a, a WhatsApp link that you can then WhatsApp us on. Uh, and allow us to walk this journey with you. And uh, welcome to God's family. For all of you other disciples, God bless you. And uh, look forward to linking up with you guys again next week. God bless you. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Listen, if this message blessed you, please be sure to share with someone whom you love. Share with a friend, a colleague, anyone. And then also, listen, support us. Support this ministry so that we can be able to make more dope content and be able to spread this message of the kingdom to as many people as possible. And then, make sure that you subscribe. Sawa, subscribe. Subscribe, wherever the button, subscribe, subscribe. God bless you guys.